Hello and welcome to the viewers of this video. This is the Orange Fan here, bringing you another entry for the episode Recap and Thoughts category. This video will be dedicated to episode 34 of Young Justice, Satisfaction. We begin this episode in Star City on March 21st where Green Arrow and Red Arrow are at the hospital that Speedy is in, and they're catching Speedy up to date with what's happened in the past eight years. We also hear that uh, the event that led to Speedy being captured was when Green Arrow and Speedy were following a lead regarding illegal activities that were being performed by LexCorp, and Speedy was captured by Lex Luthor's minions during this event. It was three months after that event when Green Arrow reunited with Speedy. In actuality, he met the Roy Harper who would eventually become Red Arrow. They also figure that Speedy is missing an arm because the Light were using the arm as a way to gather Speedy's DNA to perfect their cloning process. And naturally, Red Arrow and Guardian were created from that cloning process. Speedy is understandably upset that he's lost eight years of his life, but he actually doesn't blame Red Arrow for taking over his life, and he actually shows gratitude to Red Arrow for going through so much to find and rescue him. But Speedy is quite angry at Green Arrow, accuses Green Arrow of being useless, and demands that he leave the room, which Green Arrow does. Speedy is much calmer when he talks to Red Arrow, but he admits he wants Red Arrow to leave as well because he wants time to process everything that he's heard. Red Arrow finds Green Arrow in a chapel within the hospital, where he's frustrated with himself, thinking that he's a failure of a mentor, citing what happened to both Roy Harper's and also citing Artemis's alleged death. Red Arrow admits to Green Arrow that even though he didn't always show it, he actually does appreciate having Green Arrow as his mentor, and he knows Artemis also appreciates Green Arrow as her mentor, too. And he says that Speedy needs Green Arrow, even if Speedy doesn't want to admit that right now. And he convinces Green Arrow to go back and talk to Speedy. But when Green Arrow and Red Arrow do return to the hospital room, they find that Speedy has escaped through the window. We then cut to Mount Justice, where Superboy and Mal Duncan are talking to each other, with Nightwing also present in the room. And they're talking about how Aquaman is doing everything in his power to try and find Lagoon Boy. And they also express frustration at how Aqualad seemingly killed Artemis. They question Nightwing about if there's been any more leads regarding the Light's new partner, but Nightwing disappeared in the middle of their conversation, much like what Batman tends to do. <laughs> Superboy questions Mal where the rest of the Unjustice team members are, and Mal comments that the female members have gone to a bridal shower, while the male members, the other male members anyway, have gone to the Garado. And we actually do get to see what the Garado is. It's in another part of the cave, and it features holographic statues of fallen heroes, Justice League members and Young Justice team members alike. Artemis's statue was recently added, but we do see statues of other fallen heroes, such as Ted Kord, the previous Blue Beetle, Aqua Girl, and Jason Todd, the second Robin. Impulse questions why these statues aren't out in public, like the Hall of Justice, and Blue Beetle admits that that was something he questioned too, but he found out that the Justice League doesn't want the public to be reminded of the fact that the heroes aren't immortal. Blue Beetle also admits he's a bit frustrated that he never got to meet Ted Kord because other members of the Young Justice team actually have their mentors still around to help guide them in the ways of being a hero. 
We also see that Blue Beetle and Impulse are becoming friends over the time that Impulse has been in this time period. Next up, we head to Gotham City, where Kid Flash and Paula are visiting Artemis's grave. And Artemis's grave actually reveals her middle name. Artemis's middle name is the first name of Red Arrow and Cheshire's daughter. Paula admits that the time since Artemis's alleged passing have been very difficult for her, and she appreciates Wally uh, helping her through this time. Of course, Wally is one of the few people who knows that Artemis is not truly dead, and he shows regret that he has to keep this a secret from Artemis's own mother. In a further distance in the cemetery, we see Sportsmaster and Cheshire with her daughter are also present. Cheshire admits that while she had her differences with her younger sister, she does care about Artemis, and she, sh she admits that she wishes she'd done more for Artemis, and she takes a moment to take a jab at her father, saying that she should have protected Artemis from Sportsmaster. But Sportsmaster responds that it's too late for that now. And Cheshire says that she wants revenge on Aqualad for seemingly killing Artemis. But Sportsmaster responds that Artemis being killed by Aqualad without Aqualad or Black Manta running it by him first uh, is, uh, is a stain against his and Cheshire's professional reputation. Sportsmaster says that Cheshire can take her vengeance on Aqualad while he has a score to settle with Black Manta. We then cut back to where Speedy is, and he managed to sneak his way to what seems to be a dead-end alley, but it's actually one of Green Arrow's um, secret bases, where he stashes all of his resources for his hero work. The computer recognizes Speedy as Red Arrow because of, um, obviously because they're clones, or Red Arrow is the clone of Speedy, I should clarify. So, so the computer recognizes Speedy's DNA as Red Arrow's DNA. So anyway, Speedy enters the, enters the, um, the, uh, equipment stash, or the equipment the equipment storing area, and he proceeds to to gather up some equipment. Green Arrow and Red Arrow figure that the location Speedy ended up going to is the location that he's at, figuring that it's because they believe it's because this is one of the um, equipment storing areas that Green Arrow had set up uh, before Speedy was abducted. Red Arrow tries to um, gain access to the to the to the area, but the computer says Red Arrow is already in the in the area. But Green Arrow is able to abort the um, security measures that the computer is about to take. By the time they do enter the lair, though, um, they see Speedy is using Zeta Beam technology to teleport elsewhere. But he also leaves an explosive to destroy it so they can't follow after him. They are able to figure out where he uh, used the Zeta Beam technology to get to, and they find out he's gone to Metropolis to take his vengeance on Lex Luthor, but they fear that Speedy will end up getting himself killed going against Lex Luthor, so they try to get to Metropolis as well. We then head to Metropolis, where we see Lex Luthor and Mercy Graves are in uh, the LexCorp building, and Lex Luthor admits that uh, enabling an alien invasion has made him have to do a lot of paperwork. Meanwhile, we see Speedy is across the area from LexCorp, and he uses, a, he uses one of the weapons he took to try and attack. And Lex Luthor anticipates that Speedy is the one behind this after the attack happens, but he manages to take a suitcase from a vault before he and Mercy 
leave for try to escape the area. And Lex Luthor also tells one of his security guards, Otis, to try and take care of Speedy. We also actually cut to Ivy Town next, where Superboy is now there, and Wendy, one of his classmates from back in season one, actually wishes him happy birthday. Superboy at first admits his chron yeah, his chronological age of six years old, but then he quickly corrects himself that about the age that he's um, that the public thinks he is. Like he says he's 22 years old because that's the age that uh, the public would think he is. And Wendy compliments the fact that Superboy hasn't aged since uh, they first met, unaware of the true reasons behind that. And Wendy also brings up that Miss Martian had been known to throw surprise parties for Superboy's birthday. And even though Superboy claims he didn't like those parties, Wendy figures he actually did like those surprise parties. But she is quite sad to hear that Superboy responded that she's the only one who actually remembered his birthday this year. But then we cut to Dakota City, where... Miss Martian and Zatanna are walking to the bridal shower, and Miss Martian admits she does remember Superboy's birthday, but she didn't have time to throw him a party. Zatanna points out she really didn't have to throw him a party, and Miss Martian concedes to that, and also mentions that with Lagoon Boy missing, she doesn't really have much time for parties, even though she and Zatanna are heading to Rocket's bridal party. Yeah, it's a uh, Rockle. Ugh. It's Rocket's bridal shower party. That's the party they're going to. And we see that Wonder Girl, Bumblebee, Batgirl, and Black Canary are also present for for this bridal shower. And Rocket, though, when Rocket receives the gift from Miss Martian, and Miss Martian admits that Artemis helped her pick that gift, Rocket begins to question why she's bothering to celebrate so soon after Artemis's alleged death. But Miss Martian quickly responds that Artemis would still want them to celebrate even after her passing or alleged passing. So Rocket gives a toast to their fallen friend while the rest of the rest of the guests um, toast uh, the bride, Rocket. And Captain Cold is actually not too far from the bridal shower. He's actually trying to rob a bank that's across the street. But unfortunately for Captain Cold, um, he's not aware of the fact that several heroes were just across the street. They make their presence known, and Captain Cold easily figures out that um, he's not going to succeed in this particular crime. Back in Metropolis, we do see um, Speedy did manage to get by the security guards, and he's now in the garage where um, Lex Luthor and Mercy Graves are in trying to escape. So Speedy proceeds to fight Mercy while Lex Luthor... Can all, where Lex Luthor simply comments about how he's impressed with the arsenal that Speedy has brought with him. But he's not talking about the weaponry. He's talking about Speedy's intellect, strategy, and force of will, as he puts it. Eventually, Speedy does manage to blow off Mercy's... Um, yeah, he manages to destroy... Um, Mercy's um, cybernetic arm using what he calls a I think he calls it a detonation cord or it's a rope full of explosives on it so he uses that to destroy Mercy's cybernetic arm and he prepares to um, uh, blow up uh, Lex Luthor's arm in retaliation for Speedy losing an arm as well but before Lex Luthor loses his arm, he manages to try and talk to Speedy before he actually uh, activates the explosion. And he even offers Speedy the suitcase that he brought with him. Lex Luthor admits that he was anticipating Speedy to arrive after Speedy was rescued. 
and he questions if Speedy really wants revenge or actually wants satisfaction. Speedy opens the, the suitcase and he's quite surprised with what he sees inside of it. Eventually, Green Arrow and Red Arrow manage to arrive at LexCorp, but they find Speedy is there, and Speedy admits that he didn't kill Lex Luthor, not yet anyway, as he puts it, but he did end up taking whatever it was that Lex Luthor had in the suitcase, and we find out what it is. It's a cybernetic arm, and apparently this arm, it, this cybernetic arm is more powerful than the cybernetic arm that Mercy has. And Speedy also reveals he doesn't want to go by Speedy anymore when Green Arrow calls him that. He says that he likes the sound of the code name Arsenal, and that's how we end the episode. So this episode uh, catches, up, catches us, the audience, up to speed on what's happened with Speedy, pardon the pun. <laughs> And we now find out that Speedy is going is going to go by the code name Arsenal. And Arsenal was one of the code names that Roy Harper had went under in the main comics. Of course, the difference here is that there wasn't a clone of Roy Harper. So in this case, in the Earth-16 universe, we have two Roy Harpers that are going by different code names that the Roy Harper of the main comics went by. The clone Roy Harper is going by Red Arrow, of course, while the original Roy Harper will be going by Arsenal. And this episode definitely highlights the difference between Arsenal and Roy Har or Arsenal and Red Arrow, even though they share the same DNA. And even though Red Arrow is a clone of Arsenal, they still do have different personalities, which is a valid point. They may they may be the same in terms of DNA, but their personalities are quite different because of their experiences in life. And uh, yeah, Arsenal comes off as much more of a jerk than Red Arrow ever did. And though to be fair, I mean, Arsenal did just find out that he lost eight years of his life and he lost an arm. So I don't imagine anyone would be in a very good mood after those sort of experiences. But at the same time, yeah, even after he acquired the cybernetic arm at the, at the end, he still does seem a little antagonistic. Although we do see that is uh, motivated by the fact that Arsenal doesn't want to be put on ice again, as he puts it. And speaking of Red Arrow, uh, in this episode, Red Arrow comes off as much kinder now. I mean... Granted, Red Arrow was never a bad person to begin with. I mean, his status as the mole in Season 1 was unwilling and unknowing on Red Arrow's part. And while Red Arrow could be somewhat of a jerk, he was still shown to be a good guy who honestly cared about his friends. And But in this one, Red Arrow definitely comes off as much kinder. He didn't really come off as a jerk at all in this episode. And it was really heartwarming how Red Arrow assured Green Arrow that he is a good mentor, even though Green Arrow was beating himself up as a mentor. And he isn't wrong about the fact that Artemis definitely appreciates Green Arrow as her mentor. Insecurity was a great example that showed how much Artemis uh, appreciated Green Arrow as her mentor. So that was definitely a nice moment to show for Green Arrow. He really is a good guy, and I like how he's portrayed in the Young Justice TV series. So... I am glad that they were able to show Green Arrow's a good guy, even with um, even with the problems that have happened. And otherwise, um, yeah. So otherwise, um, we do get to see more of Lex Luthor, and Lex Luthor actually very much reminds. Uh, many people of David Xanatos, a character from Gargoyles, a show that Greg Wiseman was responsible for as well. And they Lex Luthor even paraphrases or quotes uh, David Xanatos about revenge being a sucker's game. It kind of highlights how this Lex Luthor is much more composed compared to his usual portrayals. Otherwise, that's about all we had to discuss for episode 34 of Young Justice on this channel. 
Take care and until next time.